First of all, my son's done nothing wrong. I trust him. I have faith in him. And it impacts my presidency by making me feel proud of him. Well, it only took five years, folks. We now have federal charges against Hunter Biden. But don't clap just yet, because in the dictionary next to sweetheart deal, you'll see a photo of this little angel. Federal prosecutors have reached a plea deal with deadbeat dad Hunter Biden after charging him with misdemeanor charges of failing to pay federal income tax, adding up to about $200,000. Then there's the charge of illegal possession of a firearm while being a cracked out drug offender. But with this sweetheart plea deal, Hunter will likely not spend a moment in jail. He's also avoided a trial that would have likely birthed a whole lot of information about the big guy. How convenient. It's also super convenient the Democrats have chosen to really sweep this whole thing under the rug, given how much they squawk about gun safety and tax fairness. Weird. I haven't heard them chime in too much on any Biden family member paying their fair share of the money they received by shaking down foreign nationals in exchange for favorable policy decisions, allegedly. And that's really the crux of this whole thing, folks. We want to know what services Hunter and nine Biden family members, plus the big guy Brandon, rendered to get millions of dollars from China and Ukraine and elsewhere. Hunter is gross. His degenerate ways are entertaining, but that's not what we're really concerned about here. Because there are plenty of drug-addicted, deadbeat dads out there with nasty photos alongside hookers and crack pipes. That's not the concern. But now that the injustice system has finally charged Hunter, the left and the mainstream media will claim we got what we were after. They will say justice was served. No. This is a halfway, half-baked dog and pony show that will only serve as yet another distraction from the real meat of this problem. Where's the money, Joe? Where's the five million dollars from Burisma? Will we ever know? I don't think so. No matter how much work House Oversight does to follow the money and the paper and the crime trail. My educated guess here is this is also part of the deal Joe struck with the Democrat machine and his comrades in the DOJ and DNC. Give it two months. He will announce he's not running. His pay-to-play scheme will go away. His family will get off scot-free and Gavin will be installed in his place. He'll keep his millions and his legacy and the Democrat Party will get what they really want. Gavin, you just wait, you just watch. This is all part of the plan. In 2016, you said that. I'm going to surround myself with only the best and most serious people. Well, I did do that. This and we time, had tremendous. Look, we had the best economy we've ever had. The this world time has ever seen. Your vice president, Mike Pence, is running against you. Yeah. Your ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley, she's running against you. Your former secretary of state, Mike Pompeo, said he's not supporting you. You mentioned National Security Advisor John Bolton. He's not supporting you either. You mentioned Attorney General Bill Barr uh, says you shouldn't be president again. Uh, calls you the consummate narcissist and troubled man. You recently called and uh, Barr a, a gutless pig. Uh, your the second defense secretary is not supporting you, called you irresponsible. This week, you and your White House called your White House chief of staff, John Kelly, weak and ineffective and born with a very small brain. You called your acting White House chief of staff, Mick Mulvaney, a born loser. You called your first secretary of state, Rex Tillerson, dumb as a rock. And your first defense secretary, James Mattis, the world's most overrated general. You called your White House press secretary, Kayla Kennedy, milk toast. And multiple times you've referred to your transportation secretary, Elaine Chao, as Mitch McConnell's China loving wife. So why did you hire all of them in the first place? Because I hired 10 to 1 that were fantastic. So my next guest might have a thought or two on the people Trump hired, given he was one of them. Joining me now here in Nashville, Tennessee, is former White House Press Secretary Sean Spicer. So, Sean, we have a lot to talk about. Well, first of all, congratulations on one amazing year. Thank it's you. It's awesome how far you've come. Uh, and I'm honored to be sitting where I think John Daly was. Yes. Uh, one year ago, one John year Daly ago. was occupying that seat, and he had a Diet Coke and m and So... You know, I'm just, next time yeah, you come. I at least didn't wear shorts. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I've got the legs that John Daly does. But anyway, <laughs> congratulations. Thank you. Um, you know, I didn't talk about this with John Daly, but I'm going to talk about it with you. we got a lot of things to cover. Okay. We've got Trump indictments, just Donald Trump himself. Yeah. Then we've got Hunter Biden and his, you know, they really brought the hammer down on him oh, yeah. yesterday. And then, of course, we've got the Durham testimony. I mean, there's a lot for us to get into. And then 2024. I going to say, so we've expanded second year of the show. It's now going four hours. <laughs> yes, there's a, there's a lot. So we're going to, I want to go right. first because I just played that clip. 
with Brett Baer and Donald Trump. So that interview, a lot of people were waiting for it. A lot of people, you know, were unhappy with the way it went down on both sides, right? People that love Trump, people that hate Trump. This is how it goes every time Trump comes on national television. But, you know, there were some interesting parts in that interview that I think might have changed some people's minds for better or for worse on Donald Trump. And I'm wondering what your takeaway was when he started talking about the classified documents, of course, indictment number two, and saying that, you know, all the things that he had were just newspaper clippings and he hadn't gone through them yet. You know, as somebody that worked right. closely with Donald Trump, what did you think of his explanation? And do you think the American people are going to get out of that what Trump hopes yeah. they'll get out of it? It's a great question because I think there's a couple ways to look at it. First is, is in a legal sense. I'm not a lawyer, but I've read a lot of the analysis of what lawyers have said, and, and I... I I at least think he should be concerned about some of the admissions that he made there because when I read the legal analysis of what he said, he put he very much made uh, an argument as to motive, what he was doing and why, and that will now be used in a court of law to say, well, this is how you explained it. Um, and obviously you can't say, well, the Fox interview is inadmissible because it's a public uh, right. statement. So I think there's the legal thing, which I'm probably not the best person to weigh in on, but from a PR standpoint, I think that there's, a, there's two issues here. I think he's on strong ground when he talks about the difference, that the, the way the justice system works. Mm -hmm. Mike Pence, Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton, Jim Comey all had classified information and, and it was leaked out. Uh, and, and they were let off the hook, if you will. The media likes to say, well, they, they, they gave it back. That's, that's not the whole story. Pence and Biden in particular only flew the, drew the flag out once Trump had his issues, they said maybe we should look in our Corvette, right. uh, in the boxes by the Corvette. I mean, they would have never looked had it not been for Trump. Number two, the law doesn't say anything about intent. I mean, I've had the class, I've had a security clearance for 24 years. There's nothing that says if you give it back, you're okay. It's right. there, here's the right. violations, and I think that's the one issue where I think Trump is still not doing a good job of explaining. And this time, made it sound like carelessness. Like I packed these boxes quickly. I didn't know they were intertwined. Um, with with newspaper articles and, and other things. That's not how classified information should be handled. He made it clear in 2015 that he didn't think that Hillary Clinton had handled it well and that he would do a better job. I, again, I, I don't think that for a lot of people that was the strongest argument that he could have made. Right. I think we're in a difficult place, too, because I think most of us, at least on the Republican side or the independent side, think maybe even some Democrats, they're going after Trump because he's Donald Trump. Right. Certainly with the first indictment, the payments to the porn star. I mean, we all looked at that and we said, this is baloney. Read the indictment, okay, this is baloney. And then the second one comes. We got the raid, of course. People were very upset about. And then the second indictment comes down and it's like, all right, the classified documents here. We know that everybody else and their mothers had classified documents. We know Hillary's bleach bidding and deleting and smashing things. But a lot of us that are Trump supporters sat back and said, you know... <laughs> Did you kind of do this one to yourself, Donald? Like, could you yeah. probably could have avoided this one or after the raid, maybe you could have patched things up and we could have avoided indictment number two. So as much as we want to say it's weaponized against you, which I believe it is, I also think in this certain situation, he's kind of his own worst enemy. I, and it's frustrating for those, for those that want to root for him. There is, because you can't, uh, you can't justify the mishandled classified information. And people are, are missing a couple things in here. And somebody explained it to me very well the other day that I thought finally made sense, because I'm with you. I said, look, everybody has them. Does it make it right? No, but we're having an unequal system of justice. We're going after one guy. And Trump has the Presidential Records Act. He was arguing, I have a right to these documents. They all keep saying, well, you know, he should have given them back. His argument was he was the one who flew the flag and said, I have these, I'm entitled to them under the Presidential Records Act. Mm -hmm. But here's where the line is drawn, into, and this goes to your point. A lawyer buddy of mine said to me, the second that the subpoena was issued, right or wrong, you then have to comply with the subpoena or that's when you're obstructing justice. Because if he had given them back and said, I have a right to them, I'm complying with the court order, the judge made a ruling. You don't get to just say, well, I don't agree with it. You either fight it out legally or you're in defiance of it. And I think that's where, to your point, we have a hard time justifying it. What makes you above the law? You, you could have easily gone back and said, I have a right. I want to lay out my case, my evidence. Here's why I think the Presidential Records Act allows me to keep these documents, whatever it is. 
But once he crossed the line and didn't give it back, that's to your point, he became his own worst enemy. Because, because now they can say, bottom line, a judge issued this, you failed to comply with it. And it's a lot harder to, to justify that. This is where it also gets tricky because I, part of me kind of wonders if Donald Trump walked into this almost purposefully after the raid and he saw how it bolstered his support within the GOP, if maybe he thought, hey, listen, they're going to come after me anyway, so I'm just going to fight and I'm going to be resistant <laughs> and we'll see what comes down. They're going to come after me anyway, so I might as well, you know, drive it like I stole it. I think that feels to me like maybe this does well for him when it comes I, to the polls. I, the only thing is, every other case, they called him Teflon Don for a reason. Yeah. They, all these things roll off him. I don't know. There's one thing that always, going to jail would always be the one thing that scared the heck out of me. Right. And I think in all these other cases, it's civil fines, uh, admonishments. When you're talking about federal crimes and jail time, I would tend to be a little bit more concerned about behaving in that way. I mean, and maybe he doesn't. But in the back of my head, I think that would be the one deterrent that would be unlike any of the previous circumstances. Or do you think he's so confident he's going to win the election and pardon himself? But even that, I mean, there's some question whether he can. I ultimately think he'll never do a day in jail anyway, because somebody would pardon him for the good of the country. Not pardon him, they would commute the sentence. Right. Uh, and I think, but even then, is that how you want to go down? Um, do you want to test the bounds of whether you can pardon yourself? It's never been done. And I think the problem, Tommy, is is more fundamentally this. And Brett Baer brought it up in that interview that you played the clip from. Um, there is almost not just Republicans, independents, and even a lot of Democrats like the Trump policy. Mm -hmm. It's these personal issues yeah. and quirks where people say, can I just get a little less of that? I love the policies. I love the job creation. I love the America First agenda. I love the fact that we're energy independent, that we're standing up to these foreign adversaries. But I don't need all of the personal drama. Right. And I think to your point, if he could just focus on that, there's no one that even his most ardent supporters would still be excited. It's great we got all the policies and the tough, mm -hmm. tough guy. No one's, no one's clamoring for that. And that's what I think yeah. the one thing that if he could just, and I, I know <laughs> I mean, yeah. I've talked to him, it's not going to happen. Right. But that is the one thing that if, if, I mean, it's almost like somebody could come to you and say, hey, if you added this one segment to your show, uh, it would be the number one show in the world for 10 years. At some point, you'd think about it and you'd say, um, I don't know. But it's not taking away from any of the other things you do. It's could you add this or could you tweak this one thing? And that's where sometimes I'm going, there's no one that's not telling you to just dial that back just a bit. I think it's not all his fault, though. I mean, oh. they are riddling him with legal quagmire after legal yes. quagmire, and it's not his fault. He has to talk about it, but unfortunately, it's become a giant distraction from the policies that he talked about leading up to yeah. the 2016 election, which is what he focused right, on in 2016 the, because he could, but right? But the thing is, not just are people baiting him and going after him, but the thing that I have found, I learned firsthand, frankly, is that everybody will tell him, don't do this. I did it a million times. Hey, I, it'd be better to say it this way. He would do it his own and his popularity would rise. He would, you know, uh, win a state or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think he's learned, hey, geniuses, I know how to do this a little better than you guys. And that's the thing is that he's, he has proven himself right, that people have told him over and over again, especially since he entered politics, don't do X. Right. And then he does it and his ratings go high. But I wonder though, is there a difference between popularity and electability? That's, that, and, and it's funny because I, I talk to a lot of folks around the country who say, love the policy, I won't vote for Biden, but I, I can't vote for him again. Now, where that's concerning is that in 2016, uh, I, I wrote about this in my first book, we had our, uh, the political team went in and they, they called it upshifting the downshifters, where they went in and made the election a binary choice. And at that time, Donald Trump was just a hypothetical question. What would he be versus mm -hmm. a hypothetical president, Hillary Clinton? This time, people know. And that's the one difference that a lot of people are saying, I've seen him in the Oval Office. I've seen him as the commander in chief. And either you really love him but there's enough people, and it doesn't take that much. In 2016, we won Michigan by 10,704 votes. Right. That's nothing. Arizona last time, was the difference was 10,000 votes. Trump has to understand that we are playing on the margins in a lot mm -hmm. of states. The five states that he lost by 
five states were 63 electoral votes. And voting has changed since yeah. 2016. And, and everyone now, unfortunately, is embracing this. I get it. The Democrats, sneaky, sneaky, did what they did. But voting has now changed forever. They utilized a public health pandemic to run through illegal changes. But we're not unringing this bell. And, right. and so I, for all of those reasons, I think we have to understand that, that the environment is different than it was in 2016. Yeah, it definitely is. And it's different than it even was in 2020. It's yeah. far worse, I would argue, now than it was then, even after this disastrous presidency of Joe Biden. So I want to get to Hunter Yeah. Uh, again. I feel- You may be the only person trying to get to Hunter because yeah. apparently the DOJ is Yeah, exactly. Um, how I felt this went down was we have to do something so that we can say we've done something without actually doing anything. Right. But now that gives us a talking point. Yeah. You know, the view yesterday, the women were sitting around, oh, it just goes to show not even the president's son is above the law and justice has been served here. It gives them a talking point. So even if you say, um, excuse me, rappers have gone to jail for less than what Hunter committed, they still can say, well, you know, he, he got charges, he had a plea deal, he's not above the law. So I feel like this is playing in perfectly into their hand because now they can say the Hunter thing is over, we don't talk about the big guy, and they can say that justice has been served. Is this a, a open and done case now, or are we off the Biden crime family? I don't think we are off the Biden crime family, but I think the media writ large got a box checked exactly how you laid out. Uh, and so now it's like, hey, we don't need to cover this anymore. Move on. Let's go back to Trump. Not that they were covering it anyway, but I, I don't think, I think this gives them the excuse to move on. It's mm -hmm. box checked. He served his time. I, I tweeted this out yesterday because regardless of the, the law, Democrats, after every tragic shooting, talk about more background checks, the need to, mm -hmm. to regulate guns. And here is a guy who admittedly lied on his background check. Okay, got a gun and not, here's the thing, regardless of the sentence, okay, all of these people who want to take a right, your second amendment right, were silent yesterday. You could have said, I disagree with the sentence, but not one Democrat, not one, not the Brady handgun violence, not John, all of these people that talk about how they're so committed to protecting us and making sure that people who don't have guns get guns were silent yesterday. They are complicit. And so the next time that a tragedy occurs, and God, hope, God willing, it doesn't, but statistically it will, they will come out and wring their hands about it, more background checks, more restrictions, and they sat here silent and complicit as somebody who shouldn't have had a gun, had a gun, and got away with it. And, and they said nothing. That gun, by the way, was then put in a trash can by a school, right. subsequently recovered. But where is their outrage? Because it seems though their outrage only exists when it's somebody else. And, and I, I just, again, for a million reasons, what you just said was right, but then it goes beyond that to me and just the level of pathetic um, complicity that these guys are involved in. They didn't pay, I mean, they talk about the rich paying their taxes. Yeah. Where's Here's, the pay their fair share? Pay their fair share. Uh, I mean, and literally it's like, hey, I'm sorry if that hurts, but that's what he got. And then, on, on the other hand of all this, you've still got more issues with Hunter. You've got him trying to get out of paying the child support that he is currently paying. So where's all the feminists <laughs> but who also, are always and, so bloodthirsty and after men? And, and, and it's, again, it just keeps going. It's not just the payments. He won't let this, this child uh, get his name. Legally, he's preventing it. And then the Big Joe uh, won't actually acknowledge. acknowledge that that this exists. I mean, to your point, where are all of these groups they care about children, they care about, you know, fathers stepping up and mother, I mean, all of these things. Um, I, I just, again, this gets back to the same thing with the gun. How many times are they just gonna sit silent? Well, nothing happens because, well, it's one of theirs. Right, and I think everybody feels that way, but because the media has so much power and control over the American viewer and the American voter, I anticipate this is gonna go away, but I have another conspiracy theory, which really isn't a Generally conspiracy will be theory true. at all. Um, I think that this sweetheart deal for Hunter was part of a bigger play here. I think that the Democrat Party started looking at Joe Biden, the fact that he can't walk, talk, or complete a sentence, the fact that he's now also got a lot of legal issues, he's got House oversight on his back, he's got Hunter Biden, the huge liability. I think the DNC, the, the Democrat machine, the Democrat wood chipper, 
went to Joe and said, hey, listen, this is how it's all going to play out, right? We're going to let you get off of all this stuff. We're going to keep covering for you, and we're going to let you keep your legacy, but you're not running in 2024. And pretty soon, give it two months, you're going to bow out to spend more time with your family, and we're going to bring Gavin Newsom in. I feel like that was all part of it. I feel like this was kind of a maybe an unspoken agreement that Joe gets off of this, Hunter gets off of this, and they go away quietly into the woods like Hillary did. So I'll challenge you on two fronts. One, I don't know that he's involved in any of this. Me, not, I'm sorry, the strategy. The strategy. Yeah. Because well, I've always... told us, that, Right, I see, I think that, that there are people around him that have been around him forever, the Steve Reschettis, uh to some degree still the Ron Claims of the world. There's five or six of these guys, Donilon, um, who have been making the decisions for a long time. So the extent that he's part of this equation, I think he's always been sort of a figurehead. They, they've used his name. They've, I mean, even Hunter. I mean, he, he didn't, I think mm -hmm. he just constantly was like, my dad will do this and I'll get this. And, you know, how much Joe was ever read in, I don't know. But here's my uh, sort of conspiracy theory. I believe that Joe Biden will run and be the nominee of the Democratic Party. Um, and that I still believe that Trump or whoever the nominee is will beat him, okay? But I believe that their working theory is that they believe they can win. Biden gets reelected and then steps down. Kamala Harris becomes president without ever having a single person vote for her. Do they want that, though? Do they no, want it's not that a, they a want, Kamala no, presidency? No, no, no. Uh, that's a great question. I don't think they want it. I think that when you sit back and play out the scenarios, okay, and say, how can we make this all work? In order for Joe Biden to go down before the election, they would, somebody, the, the process doesn't allow for some kingmaker in D.C. Like, you still have to have delegates vote. Uh, you have to be on so many primaries. I mean, there's so many things that would have to occur that I don't think the progressive wing of that party is going to allow, I mean, everybody wants somebody. They've got Pete Buttigieg and, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I mean, the, the progressive wing wants so many things that if you sort of allowed the process to open up where he stepped down in some way before the next convention, there would be a feeding frenzy. Sanders folks would want in. Everybody would want a piece of the nominee. But let's be honest, John. Once the Democrats are not like us, we saw this before with right. Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden, and we saw it with Hillary. It really doesn't matter which part of their wing is vying for which part of whatever, because once the machine decides who the machine wants, that's who the machine gets. Correct. But I think the problem is in a shortened... Again, I'm not saying it's impossible. I just wonder in a compressed timeline, and maybe that's the idea is you jam folks. I just think that Biden wants to run. They, they have a plan, again, to... And it, I've always maintained this is always about his legacy. And if somehow he can be part of the first woman president, especially the first female of color, then to him, that's the easier sell. All you have to do is run. You, you could beat Trump, and then you step down. You are then reelected, so you get to say you were twice elected, and you get to usher in the first female president. To him, passing that baton on and, and having this greater Biden legacy. I, I've always maintained since the beginning of this administration, this was never about achievements. This was always about how many gay left-handed people that you appointed and how many, I mean, mm -hmm. it's always been about checking boxes. How many people can you say that you did that sets the standard for the progressive future, right? So that the next president has to say, well, Biden appointed three cabinet secretaries that were transgender, so we need to do right. four, and then we need to do three people who transitioned while in office, and so now you have to do that. I mean, so this has always been about him setting the table for his legacy. And I believe that somehow they want to figure out a way. They know she's unelectable. She knows she's highly unpopular. But they don't care. To, to, in my opinion, it's all about how do we get to claim credit for developing this broader progressive legacy that no one will ever be able to challenge. That's a very interesting take. And... I still am going to stick with my Gavin Newsom I, I, thing hey, listen, because the, I man don't think is, the man is running a shadow campaign oh my currently. God. I mean, he's currently campaigning. If Joe Biden actually knew what was going on, he'd be worried. I mean, what, what, what Gavin Newsom is doing, like if any normal candidate would be like, I mean, watch Trump when he did that interview with Brett Baer and Brett asked him about, you know, DeSantis and he says, he did this, he did this, and then I got mad. And I mean, like, he's methodical about following the guy, right? 
Biden's like, where's Gavin Newsom? Is he with Hunter? I mean, it's so pathetic yeah. that Gavin is literally like coming over and saying, can I just visit the White House? And he's measuring mm -hmm. drapes. Yeah. And the Bidens are like, well, this guy just could be into interior decorating. Like, we yeah. don't, like it's happening in front of his face. Yeah, that's why I have maintained for a long time now, long before anybody was saying it, I said Gavin's going to run. As soon as he started singling out Florida and Texas, yeah. boom, 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 back and forth, ping-ponging between the two, I knew he was going to run. So I still maintain I think that's what's going to happen. Listen, I don't, listen, he is the only person that is actively trying to create this buzz. So I don't dismiss it. Um, I just... I look at the how the, uh, the Kamala problem. Yeah, the Kamala how do you problem. get by her? Because how do you go back to a, a straight white dude? I mean, he's he's metrosexual, yes. but I don't think that counts. Yeah, I um, think you pay Kamala off because I think she can be bought. I really do. Yeah, or maybe she stays on for his VP or something. I don't know, but oh, I don't think that's going to happen. Can you imagine the bloodbath if they oh if they relegate her to VP the again? Yeah, I mean, but anyway, I look. I I think that anything's possible right now. Um, but I, I just I think that they're looking for the path of least resistance and how to build that bigger, broader legacy that sort of lays claim because they know he's not going to accomplish anything. I mean, like his accomplishment is taking an F inflation down to a D minus. He's like, look, it's only six percent right. now. I mean, that that's his level. I mean, there is nothing better under this administration. The president was on, I think, with ABC News, David Muir, I believe. And he said, when you turn on the TV, there's nothing that's going well. Why would you think things are good? Right, our foreign policy is a disaster. Our, so many things in the economy are of concern: interest rates, inflation, and I get it. People are concerned about, it, but right now they're just trying to figure out how do we get this ship, you know, continue to move it for the next little while to get into a second term. Yeah, I think that the ship is sinking. Uh, I think the ship is taken on water. Oh, it's, and yeah. I think it's taken on water faster than they could have ever imagined. So real quick, I just want to get to the other elephant in the room, um, figuratively speaking, and that's Ron DeSantis. Yeah. So he's obviously, campaign is in full swing now. We know, in, at least in my mind, it is a Ron versus Don race. It always has been, even before Ron announced. But I'm wondering what you think the possibility is that Ron DeSantis surges in the polls wins some states, and becomes the nominee. So the, here's the only way that this works. If Ron DeSantis wins Iowa and or one other state, he has a shot. If you lose all four early, um, the plans are not required to be into the Republican National Committee in terms of the date and the method of which the primary caucus will be held until October 1st. That being said, we've started to see the calendar take some shape with these states floating out their dates. This is going to be the probably the longest duration from the Iowa caucus till Super Tuesday. So you're going to need money and resources to continue. DeSantis needs to show big donors and grassroots activists, hey, I can take down the king, right? The only way you can take down the king is by winning one of these states and saying, see, I beat him and I'm racking up delegates. Um, I think he has gone all in on Iowa. The one thing that he has going for him in Iowa is history. There have been massive fluctuations of polls. It's mm -hmm. a place that really enjoys the candidates having those one-on-one -on -one discussions uh, in a way that New Hampshire does, but, but because it's smaller and because it's caucus, you have to get people motivated. You have to get them to be able to go out there and stand in a room mm -hmm. for hours on end. Um, if DeSantis can go all in in Iowa and, and beat Trump, I think it's, we're, we got ourselves a race. Wow. Um, Trump, when he in 2016, he won 16 winner take all states. In 2020, although he wasn't challenged primary, another group of states, uh, it was into the mid 20s, and around 25, switched into winner take all. Trump, that system where he can win a plurality and take all the states' delegates, was his key to success in 2016. If more states, which is where the Trump campaign has been spending their time behind the scenes, get states to move to a winner take all, option, which mm -hmm. is available after Super Tuesday, that's going to give Trump a huge delegate operation. So if you think about it, in 2016, Trump got 65% of the delegates, but only won 43% of the vote. Right. This is the key to his success. And this is the key to right now to understanding this race. DeSantis can pick him off in one or two of these early states. We got a race going because it, everyone else will sputter out of, I mean, Pence and, and Chris Christie. Well, they're, they're non factor. They're, they're non factor, anyway. but those one and 2% yeah. right. uh, are where DeSantis goes from, say, 23. If you're with Pence or Christie, or if you're the person with Asa Hutchinson, um, you've got to figure out where you go afterwards because you're clearly decided you're not a Trump person. 
DeSantis would be the likely beneficiary of them. So the goal for DeSantis World is to get as many of those folks to drop out as quick as possible and try to pick up their, their support and go head-to-head -head with him in a bunch of these uh, Super mm -hmm. Tuesday states if you can get the momentum. But if he doesn't win in Iowa, um, and I just don't think he can win in New Hampshire, I think he would have a better shot in Nevada than South Carolina. But again, that's another story. He comes out all four of those states with, a, with an L. I, I think it's a hard sell to get you to Super Tuesday. This is going to be an interesting time. Oh, and, yeah. and we could have another indictment before then, so I, you never know. I, and then what is that exactly? And then what yeah. does he say? Um, there's, it, it, You know, the funny thing is, I remember when I started at the Republican National Committee, we would go talk to news organizations about segments, and they say, you know, we really don't do a lot of politics right now. And now, I mean, it's this has doing. become like a full-on sport. You want to know who's up, who's down. Uh, so it's... I. I you know, for me, this is this is my sports. And then wait until how fun it's going to be when, like I told you, Gavin Newsom gets in the race. But oh. we'll have you back and we'll talk about it Always because become... I can't wait. This is going to be an interesting summer, an interesting fall, and an interesting year. It is. Sean, I appreciate you being here as always, Thanks, giving Sandra. us all the information. I super appreciate it. And I hope that you'll come back and see us in Nashville soon. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here in Nashville. Thank you for having me.